Hi, my name is Debbie Steele, and I'm a very proud member of Community Build. Yeah, woohoo! And um, first of all, I want to thank you all for being here. It's just so great to see the community involved in the housing issue. I want to thank all of you who came to see Community First, A Home for the Homeless. How many out here saw, just saw that film? Yeah. Yeah, and um, I was really I, I was really taken by some of the comments that people made about the film. Hopeful is that what you said? Encouraged. Encouraged. Robin from Olicap. Encouraged. It, it's it's just really a wonderful opportunity to see how people have been impacted by community. And that's what we try to do at Community Build in two ways. One is to engage the community to build houses and one to build houses for the community. And I have to say, like in the film, I was surprised at how it impacted me in terms of my new love of community because of what we experience together. So it's it's really wonderful. I want to welcome you all here too. It's um, the history of these under the tent events is that about two or three months ago I was driving down San Juan and the tent's been sitting here for several months with nothing underneath it except deer. And I thought, you know, we need to be using that tent or we need to take it down. So I was thinking we're going to take it down. And then the next morning I woke up with this inspiration that we should have events here during the summer while the weather's nice that were housing related events. So I collared my friend Carla Maine and Debbie Steele and I told them this idea and I said, would you guys help me pull this off? And they said, of course, you know, I'm always roping people into doing stuff. And so then the thing grew and it grew and it grew. So right now we have four events. This is the second of four. And there can be more as long as the weather's good. Thursday nights, the church has given us permission to use the tent for events so if you get inspired by something that's going on with any of these events and you want to coordinate something let me know and I'll make sure the church is good with the date that you pick and help you promote it it doesn't it can be anything like uh, any of the breakout sessions tonight might lead to another under the tent smaller event it doesn't have to be a big one but what we're doing is bringing the community together and the more we get to know each other and meet each other and understand what each other's doing the stronger our network of support for housing needs in our community is. I have to say, I haven't even been at Community Build for a full two years yet. It's two months shy of two years. And my whole perspective on the shelter issue has so changed by my learning over that period of time. So I've learned about my implicit biases. I've learned about what I didn't know about, um, you know, what how hard it is to the housing situation in our Community Housing Solutions Network is under that beautiful purple tent, so you'll hear from them shortly. But I just want to say what will happen if you get involved in some way today is you will become part of that growing network. And if you look at the booth of Housing Solutions Network, have them point out the picture of what a network looks like, and you'll figure out what I'm talking about. So I just want to say a couple things about the event. There's a basement stairway down there by the railing, and at the very back corner of the church is a restroom if you need to use a restroom. We do not have a Santa can here today. There are cold drinks in those two coolers. Please help yourself. QSC just donated them to me today. Um, the thing that I've noticed most about my involvement in housing is that the more I ask people to give, the more people want to give. It's just amazing how... Uh, it, 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 I guess the thing I'm going to do, I'm going to have a table after we're done with this morning, this first portion about leadership, because I want to help you guys understand how you also can be a leader. I'm comfortable with it now because I've been in leadership roles for a couple decades, but it's not hard. So I want to help anybody that wants to do more leadership know how to do that. And that will be my breakout session, which will happen probably within about a half hour from now. Um, I want to thank Thank Jim Lyman and the Evangelical Bible Church. He gave us the land to build the shelters on. 
and he just continues to say yes and yes and yes every time I ask him. Since then, I have gotten to know Scott Rosecrans, which you're going to meet in a second. He's another, represents another congregation. I've gotten to know Melanie Jackson because we're now Community Build working behind New Life Church. I've gotten to know Paul and Elizabeth from First Pres because of their involvement in various projects. So the network just, um, it's growing for me and I hope for you too. So uh, I want to introduce someone from New Life Church to speak next. Jim Scarantino is a previous attorney and he's the project manager for something Community Build is helping New Life Church with right now, creating a kind of a defunct building into a now livable rental or livable unit. So Community Build has been interacting with New Life and we're just about done with that. But Jim let me know just yesterday that he knows about a law that I want you guys to know about. So come tell them about that law. So I was asked to discuss what churches can do on their property to provide housing for the homeless. The simple answer is they can do a lot and there's little local government can do to stop them. Uh, the churches have been recognized as having uh, religious rights under the U.S. and Washington constitutions to provide, to host housing on their property. And the church uh, courts have recognized that it, it constitutes a religious practice, worship, and praise. Uh, the, there's actually a federal law called the Federal Religious Land Use Law that also protects it. Washington's constitution guarantees absolute freedom of conscience in all matters of religious sentiment, belief, and worship, so long as the practices are not inconsistent with the peace and safety of the state. In 2019, the legislator codified the principles announced by the Washington Supreme Court, uh, which held that a temporary moratorium on homeless camps constituted a substantial burden on a church's religious rights and was therefore unconstitutional. I'm reading from a handout that Debbie has, and we can get you uh, more of this. I tried to condense what are very dense laws into a one-page handout. <clears throat> As a result of that ruling by the Washington Supreme Court and federal rulings, the Washington legislature basically codified what churches can do, even though their rights under the Constitution, the state and federal Constitution, are broader. These new laws in Washington prohibit local governments from, quote, substantially burdening, close quotes, a church's homeless hosting program. Only those conditions necessary to protect public health and safety may be imposed. And necessary means no less restrictive alternative exists. That's a tough standard for a local government to meet. Churches by statute now are explicitly authorized to and may not be substantially burdened in hosting safe parking, tiny homes villages, tent and RV camps or sleeping inside a church's buildings. A city cannot restrict the number or size of these projects, which is, I think, impacts uh, Port Townsend. Uh, I would say uh, that Port Townsend's uh, prohibition against further tiny homes villages cannot apply to a church. There can be a tiny homes village here. There can be a tiny homes village across at Lathe Grace Lutheran. There could be one at out at New Life Church. This is the new state law. A city cannot limit a church to only one form of hosting on its property. In other words, it may have safe parking and tiny homes on its same property. Mobile homes are conceivably may be allowed as part of hosting the homeless. For most situations, and here we'd have to spend some time looking at the statute itself, time limits are illegal. Local governments may not impose time limits on churches hosting programs for the homeless. A church must provide sanitation facilities, but not showers. Sprinkler systems for inside a building are not required, just two accessible exits. The legislator realized that a lot of old church buildings don't have sprinkler systems, but they're going to allow shelters inside churches as long as there's two accessible exits. A city may not impose permit fees greater than the actual cost of processing the permit application. So recently, in our little project, we went down to get a roofing permit for this building. We had to get a roof permit. And the city staff didn't know what the charge is because we're a commercial building. And the statute, the, the rules here are that it, you're charged by the square foot for a commercial building. So they said charge in the residential building and it took two minutes and we paid $102.50. Under this law, they couldn't really charge us that much. 
uh, they can only charge us the actual time it took them to look, basically just issue the permit, which is two minutes. That's true for every permit application for any church project hosting the homeless. It hasn't been tried much, uh, certainly not in this county, uh, but I think it has down in Pierce County where they have a tiny homes village on a Christ that's called Christian Church. Um, homeless is not defined. Now, does that mean a surgeon at the hospital who can't find a place for under $2,000 a month or 3000 a month? I don't know. But I think churches have to act in good faith in applying this standard. It is not defined. But homeless could mean somebody who has some means, some income. But in our market here, it is impossible for them to find a place. So they are therefore homeless. And we know lots and lots of people. We have two people living on our property right now who meet that criteria. They cannot possibly afford any any place in town here. They'd be on the streets if they weren't uh, living on our church property. Um, the laws do not change the Department of Revenue's blanket prohibition against churches receiving rental payments. Churches cannot charge and receive rent. And it's unclear whether even um, to cover costs is legal. We know this from personal experience with the Department of Revenue. We can have questions later. Um, all that is required to get going is that the church hold a quote unquote public hearing. And it's the city's obligation to provide notice of the public hearing. People come, you have a public hearing. The church can do it with only 96 hours notice. You can hear all the concerns, your neighbors tearing out their hair and beating their chest and go ahead and do whatever you want. <laughs> Now we laugh, but this is a church. And so this handout you're gonna see has a parenthetical. Is this how a church should act towards neighbors? Because if a church is gonna be a genuine expression of Christ in this neighborhood, in this community, we not only have to love the homeless that we bring onto our property, but our neighbors, and it's hard. This is a hard point for churches facing. So anyway, there's the handout. It has the statute uh, citations in it, and um, I think afterwards, I don't know if there's any time for questions now, but I'd be glad to talk to you later on. So I wanna bring Scott Rosecrans up here. Scott Rosecrans applied that law to his willingness to house Peter's Place out at the Methodist Church in Hadlock. He'll tell you about that. And other things. And other, yeah, yeah, and, uh, and other things, right. So uh, thank you again for uh, having me. I've, I've made probably most of these under the tent meetings, and uh, they're very informative. So first off, thank you for being here, and I hope if you watched the movie that you enjoyed the movie. This is the third time I've seen it. I learn something new every time I see it, and uh, keep thinking I need to show it out in Port Hadlock and uh, for, invite the people in Port Hadlock to. Sign up right here for anybody. <laughs> <that wants. laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's right. John offered me his. Okay. Anyway, so anyway, thanks for being here. The movie, it's all true and it's all right here. Um, I've been at Community United Methodist Church now for six years. I'm st I just started my seventh year and when I was introduced to the Staff Parish Relations Committee, they wanted to know what they thought my mission as the, uh, the formerly unemployed prosecutor, what they thought my mission was going to be. And I said, well, I know from being the drug court prosecutor that the tri area is ground zero for homelessness, unemployment, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, uh, you, you name it. I said, we're right slap dab in the middle of it, and we need to do more, because Community United Methodist Church had already done quite a bit by using some of its property for senior housing, but it had been about 20 years, and it was time to go ahead and do more. So I said, well, let's start identifying the issues. And, it, and we started listening to the needs of the people that were coming to us weekly. They would come by the church, needing a QFC card, or it would be people living in their camper saying, I just need a safe place to park my camper at night. I'm tired of the police banging on my door or angry neighbors shining lights in my windows or I had a lot of single women that were living in their vans because they had lost their apartment. They had no place to shower. They had no place to use the bathroom. Uh, so I just started, we started listening to the needs of the people. So we, we started looking into a safe parking uh, ministry, a safe parking lot parking ministry, did a lot of research, found one over in, uh, in uh, Seattle that had already done a lot of the research, found out about this law that uh, was passed unanimously by both houses in Congress, unanimously, and signed into law in 2000 saying, hey, you're a church. If it's for church business, if it's something religious, you can do it. Even, one of the few times all the politicians agreed on something, and they just went ahead and signed 
right into the law. We just haven't been taking advantage of it. So that was pre-COVID, and we were, we were making a lot of progress. Well, COVID hit, and it's like, well, we got to put the brakes on this because uh, we couldn't find monitors, and we didn't really know how bad COVID was. So we kind of put the brakes on it. I was a little disappointed. Well, about 10 months later, uh, I get a, uh, I, I get a, a phone call from Peter Bunyan. I have never met him, didn't know who he was. He said, hey, my name's Peter Bunyan. Uh, I belong to a group of people that have built a bunch of tiny homes, but we don't have any place to put them. And we heard your church has got a lot of property you're not using. Can we put them there? I said, sure. I said, uh, it's fine with the Methodist Church. We'll be the least of your problems. I said, now, unfortunately, we have leased that property to Olecap. If it's okay with Olecap, it'll be okay with me. So we had a little discussion with Olecap and, and uh, came to a meeting of the minds, and Olecap said, yeah, it is a good idea. Uh, they were a little concerned about having a bunch of homeless people living next to a bunch of retired people, but that's okay. So they, they agreed. Greg Brotherton, our county commissioner, got involved. Kind of took the county by surprise. It's like, hey, what's going on out in Port Hadlock? There's a tiny home village going up, and nobody asked us about it. Well, well, you know, Craig came out, but see, he was part of the Holy Cab board. He came out and really helped facilitate a lot of the things that we needed to do because it is church property. We can pretty much do whatever we want to, but they had to issue a sanitation permit and a stormwater runoff. No big deal. No big deal. So it all, it all started It all started with a phone call. Scott, you have one more minute. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> try to take the mic. Try to, yeah. Hey, you're lucky I wrote this stuff down. Yeah, so... <laughs> It started with a phone call, and the next thing you know, I got a tent across the parking lot, and I'm watching these wonderful volunteers showing up to build tiny homes on our on our property. So it was really pretty cool. So uh, building a tiny home on your church property or an apartment or, or whatever it is uh, for a church, it is an exercise in religion because you're giving drink to the thirsty, food to the hungry, shelter to the homeless, clothes to the naked, a place for the sick to live and you're visiting the inmate, it, it can't get more any more religious than that, and they know that, and they can't stop you because you are helping the least of God's children out there. So it's, it's something that we, we should be doing. So we've been thrilled to host Peter's Place, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, before we opened Peter's Place, because of all the traffic we were getting, we converted three of our empty rooms. Now, I don't know a church out there that doesn't have a room they're not using other than storing Mr. Coffee coffee makers. <laughs> Clean that room out and find a use for it. So we converted three of our rooms. We have a mission workroom, we have a clothes closet, and we have a food pantry, and we're open every Saturday now. And we opened up, when Peter's Place opened up, we opened up because those folks needed clothes, fans, shoes, food, you name it. And if we didn't have it, we'd go ahead and get it. And we've been open for 19 months, and we're open every Saturday from 10 to 1 doing that. And we've gotten to know these people because I have gotten phone calls from people. It's like, What's it like having a bunch of, you know, drug addict homeless people living in your backyard? That's why I hadn't found any needles or whiskey bottles or anything. I said, these are wonderful people. They come over. They meet us. We meet them. We try to be the good experience with organized religion for them so that uh, they like us and they know us all by name. So they've been really great. And what it's done, it's energized our congregation. We really haven't grown. We have had people join the church because they like what we're doing. But it's energized the people that, that I had, and they're so excited about about, about what we're doing. And it all happened because we said yes. I didn't do anything special. I just said yes. And that's all you got to do is say is say yes. Okay, so when we're going to break out, we're going to break out here in a few minutes. What you need to think about are the things that you take for granted. The roof over your head, the door that locks, a place to take a shower, a place to use the restroom, a place to get out of the cold, a safe place to park, a place where you can charge your phone, phone and a place where you can access the internet. So when you go back to your congregations, just think about it. What can you say yes to and how can we help you achieve that? Yay! Hi, my name is Carla. I'm really excited to be here. I, I love that movie. I've watched it a couple of times and I cry every time I see it. It's just so powerful. So there's a couple of themes that I'm hearing in what people are saying today. One is we're talking about community. And one of the reasons why I got involved with the housing crisis is because I love this community and I want to maintain uh, this community in terms of its affordability, in terms of its accessibility, 
accessibility and in terms of our community spirit. Now we are all have all been invited here today from the faith community. So we have a really special connection to the community and we have a special connection with one another because we're people of faith and we don't want to just talk about what we believe. We want to live what we believe. We want to be examples of what we believe and we've got a lot of opportunities for that. One of the things that I that's happened to me over this time period I've been involved with Coast Winter Shelter for 18 but not that yeah 18 it's it's been it's been around 18 years I wasn't there at the very beginning so maybe 16 years and thank you so maybe what may, Karen knows it all she she Karen's the the center of uh, Coast Winter Shelter so so um, what's happened for me is that my vision has grown that it's not just the homeless people in our community that need help and they certainly do and we want to expand our outreach to them it's also people who are your school teachers who are uh, firefighters, who are uh, dental hygienists, who are people who cannot afford to buy or rent a place in our town. This is a crisis, and our town is changing a lot. We all see it. I have felt it very deeply, and, you know, one of the things that I used to do, and I still do sometimes, is complain a lot about it and feel really hopeless and helpless and, uh, like, what the heck can I do? The economy is changing changed, housing prices are going up all over the place. I can't do anything to fix that. Well, you know what? I can't do anything, but we all can do something together. And that's what these sessions under the tent are all about, is figuring out how much do I care about my community? How can I be more connected with my community? And what can I do in concert with other people to help? Um, so that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, I'm not going to do all my other notes. There's a whole lot of ideas that I have. I'm sure there's a whole lot of ideas that you have, and we want to capitalize on those ideas and capitalize on what you're called to do. Liz. Yes, Liz is the director of Housing Solutions Network, and she's going to speak next. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Carla. Can everybody hear me okay? Everybody in the back? Good? All right. I'm going to follow off my phone because if I don't stick to a script, then I will also have a sermon and it'll look a lot like a soapbox. So here we go. Uh, my name is Liz. I am the new director of Housing Solutions Network. Um, thank you. Our focus is on increasing and protecting affordable units for our workforce housing. HSN's vision is for every individual to have access to abundance of affordable and desirable homes for those who, lurk, uh, who work and live here in our community. In a recent report, one of the leading reasons for homelessness is not mental illness or drug addiction. It is lack of housing units. And I think we need to dissect that a little bit more, okay? Um, but I do think that Scott is onto something. This idea that we can identify a barrier and all it takes is one person to say yes can make a huge difference. In 2017, after the local community declared a housing emergency, Siobhan Canty from Jefferson Community F uh, Foundation saw a solution, said yes, and out of that, HSN was born. The beauty of HSN is a, ne a network approach. This means we don't follow the traditional nonprofit structure. In Instead, we ignite activists to help create community-based solutions. Myself, our new network weaver, Kelsey Kodbeck, is in the back, along with some other volunteers and activists. We're here to inspire, engage, and incubate solutions across the housing landscape. Community Build is one of those great examples. We look to all of you under this tent to help remove the barriers to housing in our community. HSN recently mailed out a brochure to every mailbox in our county, encouraging people to provide their own solutions. Build an ADU. Convert your short-term rental to a long-term solution. Say yes to an opportunity. So with that, I ask all of you today, what is your yes? Thanks, Judy. My name is Maria Drury, and I joined the staff at Habitat for Humanity two years ago. Um, and I'm here because of our mission, which is seeking to put God's love into action. Habitat for Humanity brings together people to build homes, communities, and hope. And I was profoundly moved by the movie that we saw before uh, our meeting here today. And, and I saw community, I heard people's reaction as being one of hope 
and home is at the heart of our mission. And so when I joined Habitat two years ago, I was working from home. We were all working from home. We had suspended our group builds, our volunteer opportunities. And two years later now, we are welcoming volunteers. We are welcoming um, congregations, com um, groups, individuals back onto our job sites, uh, to our store. And so we're here. We have a, a nice shady spot over there under the under the tree. Uh, <laughs> and we would love to be in conversation with congregations that would like to return to Habitat or in, in explore opportunities with Habitat to spend a day or a commitment over time to come and volunteer with us. No, com no experience is necessary to, to build on our sites. I'm just delighted and so grateful on a daily basis with the staff, the, the colleagues that I work with, both who are involved in construction, who are staffing our store, and um, and I think that each of us individually and as congregations and as a, a community can really address this whole spectrum of challenge from unsheltered to the ability to own a home. Um, in in June, we we gave keys to three families who had been working over this last year to, to build their homes. And their families that are, in one case, a single person, and in another case, a family that has three generations that will live together in, in that home. So if you're interested in finding out how you can either re-engage with Habitat or how you can become engaged with Habitat, we would love to have that conversation. Thanks, Marla. Thank you. Thank you. Maria or Marla? Maria. Thanks, Maria. Um, Karen. Yeah, yeah. We I want to keep these comments short because we want to save the breakout session time. But yeah, you can come up and then Robin, you can come next. Oh no, uh, what's your Carolyn? Sorry, I thought you were. I'd love to talk to any of the folks from uh, from Coast who have been uh, a volunteer coordinator or a pastor. Um, after the last session, I went to Debbie Steele and I said, what does it take to build a tiny home? And she says it costs $5,000 for the shell of a tiny home. And I said, well, that sounds interesting. I think that Coast would be interested in uh, that kind of a partnership. So I said, I've got to talk to Kathy Morgan first at Only Cap and find out uh, what the deeds are, what they're interested. Well, they said, we've already raised $25,000 for five. I said, well, what if Coast um, put in $25,000 and uh, purchased uh, five other? And that would mean we would have 10 tiny homes that we could move on to uh, Caswell Brown, which is on Mill Road, you know, it's, it's kind of like the other shelter. Um, I, and so I have sent a notice out to all the churches that we are really interested in having church participation in finishing the inside of a tiny home, using our ability to buy in bulk, because we're gonna need like 10 beds, 10 mattresses, we're going to need 10 uh, refrigerators and whatever else that, and finish the inside. And that would be a way that you could be introduced to homeless. And as we have done in our meal program, sit down and have a meal with someone who uh, has, um, has now a home. Uh, we think it'd be a great support to OLICAP. We've, we've been there for 18 years providing uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of meals, hot dinners, breakfast and lunch, and uh, we want to continue that hospitality in the future. So it's a way for us to get involved. I'm thinking First Baptist Church, if you've ever been in there, is very small. They, they would not be able to have anybody sleeping in their sanctuary because there isn't a room. I'm not sure if they have parking or not, so I'm not sure they'd be able to get yeah, right. So adopt a tiny home out at Caswell Brown. Uh, it would be a great opportunity. So thanks, Debbie Steele, for for getting giving me the idea that uh, this would be something that we could do positively in this community. And if you want to talk to me while I'm uh, here, stop by. Thanks. We'll pick a table that's not occupied, okay?
So I just want you guys to follow up to Karen's comment that um, we just learned yesterday Community Build has been given permission by OLECAP to build 10 new shelters for Caswell Brown. We hope to get them started before the end of August. We want to use those shelters as a way of uh, teaching some of the residents at Caswell Brown how to build homes for themselves and we could use more volunteers and when we built the other shelters Tim Lawson who was the previous director of the School of Woodworking spearheaded the effort to put desks and bed frames and shelving in each of those shelters and I wouldn't be surprised if he wouldn't sign up for that again so if you want to learn building skills come volunteer with Community Build we'll get you hooked up go back to your churches adopt one of the interiors like Karen suggests and this is Carolyn <laughs> Hi. I just wanted to mention the um, that brochure that came out didn't mention anything about Section 8 certificates, and a lot of people are not very aware of those. Um, but a Section 8 certificate enables a person to rent an, uh, an apartment or a house um, for a third of their income. The problem in, in Port Townsend is... Well, so a friend of mine got a Section 8 certificate. People laughed at her when she said she w was looking for a place in Port Townsend, and indeed she had to just give it up and not, not use that certificate because she could not find a place that rented for... So there's a limit that the housing authority puts on how much the rent, the rent can be because they subsidize the rest of the rent. And, the, and people people's rent. So if you have an apartment or an ADU that you're not using, it would be incredible to rent it out for the price that's within those limits. And that's what I'm doing with my apartment, my ADU. And in fact, um, the, I kept the rent to my tenant. I, I never raised the rent because he couldn't afford any more until he got a Section 8 certificate, and then I was able to raise the rent. <laughs> and I'm still, like, way low. People laugh at me for renting for so low. But I'm so pleased to be able to rent to someone on a Section 8 certificate. Thank you. Yeah. And...